Hey, Bastish BF for 64K, and welcome to another episode of Top Tens. Welcome to 64K, hosted by Bastish B. And welcome back. So on today's episode, we're going to be looking at my top 10 favorite Navy simulators on the Commodore 64, whether that be boat or submarine, anything Navy related. So you can think of uh, this list as more traditional. When you think of simulations, you think of like flight simulators, but just on boats or submarines. That's pretty much what it is. So for the simulation aspect, as long as the game has semi-realistic style of gameplay, that involves either boats or submarines, then it's going to be included, or could be included. So that pretty much eliminates any games that are like shoot 'em ups dealing with games that at least have some sort of sort of realistic gameplay. It doesn't matter what style of gameplay, as long as it has that criteria, although most of this list is what you would call traditional simulations. And now that we got all that nonsense out of the way, just like in all my lists, right before the number one reveal, I'll give a small little honorable mentions list, just a few games that might be worth looking at outside of the top 10. And having said that, let's start this countdown. Bismarck was released in 1987 by PSS, Personal Software Services. They were a British software company that specialized in strategy war games, but a lot of them either had simulation or arcade elements as well. Many of their games were released through Datasoft in the US, and you can see more about that in my recent Datasoft documentary. If you didn't know, the Bismarck was one of the biggest World War II battleships the German Navy ever produced. It was considered unsinkable. Its mission was to disrupt Allied supply lines in the Atlantic Ocean by taking out vulnerable targets. In the game, which is a mixture of strategy and arcade action, you get to choose whether you want to play as the Bismarck, taking out allied targets before retreating south or to France, thus winning the game, or be the British Navy, and you can reenact every battle that took place in 1941 before the Bismarck sinking, including the Doom Battle versus the HMS Hood, and even the Swordfish plane attack. The Bismarck was able to sink the HMS Hood and damage HMS Prince of Wales, causing the British fleet to retreat. Board a warship in pursuit of the Bismarck. British sea power seeking vengeance on that German battleship which blew up the mighty battle cruiser Hood. The signal comes by wireless. An American built Catalina seaplane has spotted the fleeing Bismarck. But that sent the British Navy into overdrive as they sent everything after the Bismarck to take her out once and for all. In the game, you plot your interception call, send planes to do air searches, and once the Bismarck is found, it's just full on action mode. Blasting away while also repairing your ship is as frantic as it gets. Two days after the HMS Hood sunk, and the order is given by Admiral Somerville in charge of operations torpedo planes to the attack. The British Air Force launched 16 Swordfish biplane torpedo bombers to attack the Bismarck. One torpedo hit and severely damaged the behemoth. In the game, you can actually reenact the Swordfish attack run, and it plays out like an arcade flight sim, with you only getting one shot to land your torpedo. The Bismarck's final battle was the next day, as the King George V and the Rodney blasted away at the crippled ship. Two other ships also joined, including the Dorsetshire. The Rodney hit the Bismarck with a torpedo, and the Dorsetshire finished it off with two more. Two 1,800 shells were fired at the Bismarck before its final demise. The destruction of the Bismarck, that great and powerful ship, had to be accomplished to be true to the traditions of the British Royal Navy. The game's mixture of light strategy elements and fast arcade style action is really fun. I played the UK version of this on tape in the 80s and loved reenacting all the battles. Whether from the German or British side, it was just really cool. The sound is also quite good, as is the opening SID tune. The graphics are simplistic and nothing great, but they do the job and are satisfying enough when it comes down to it. This was PSS's 10th game in their war game series, and I'd highly recommend you check out some of the other games. Overall, it's fairly simple simplistic and easy to get into, which is two things that this genre is not known for. Number nine. 
Destroyer Escort was released in 1989 by Microprose. The game is based on a destroyer type battleship that was used as an all round attack ship from anti-submarine, anti-boat and anti-aircraft capabilities and was used extensively in the Pacific Theater of Operations. This game puts you in the role of a captain of a destroyer class ship in the North Atlantic during World War II, tasked with escorting six convoys of ships from one port to the other. You choose the route you want to try and accomplish and various other parameters before setting off. Your sole mission is to defend the group against any attacks from sea or air. If you're familiar with the genre, you're probably thinking this looks a lot like Epix's Destroyer. And yes, I'm pretty sure they took some major inspiration from that classic when making this game. The game has all the usual screens to help you navigate the ship, from bridge to the guns, sonar, map, etc, etc. And as soon as you start, you're going to need a beeline it for your group and then wait and see what direction the attack is going to come from. Then intercept and destroy as quickly as possible. The game sports minimalistic sound, but some decent graphics and presentation. The biggest downside though is loading between switching views on your ship is way too long and slows the pace of an already slow game down to a crawl at times. This game would place much higher on the list if an easy flash version was available, eliminating the loading. And don't forget, you're going to need instructions for this one, which luckily are pretty easy to find online. Without them, your history. It was released by Micropost, whose simulation pedigree was almost unrivaled during this period. If you have the patience for the insane loading time, then this is a really solid destroyer simulator, let down by some technical issues that a company such as Micropost should really have taken care of before release. Strike Fleet was released in 1987 and was developed by Lucasfilm and distributed by Electronic Arts. This was one of the rare occasions when a naval simulator was based on modern naval warfare. Well, modern circa 1987-88. You take on the role of a fleet of battleships, hitting up all the hot spots in the news at the time, like the Persian Gulf and the Falklands. A lot of real life situations were happening during this period, with the Gulf oil tanker attack and the US Navy's retaliation at the mining of the Gulf Sea, which hit one of their ships, the Samuel B. Roberts. Just days after USS Samuel B. Roberts hit the mine, President Reagan ordered U.S. forces to strike back. Petty Officer Chuck Moore has the story. President Reagan ordered defensive action in response to the mining of USS Samuel B. Roberts. On the morning of April 18th, two Iranian oil platforms, Sasan and Siri, were destroyed by naval gunfire and demolitions. They must know that we will protect our ships, and if they threaten us, they'll pay a price. This game was a case of art imitating life. So controlling a fleet of ships instead of just one is a pretty chaotic experience, especially when the action sets in and makes the game feel almost like an RTS strategy game. There's 10 missions to choose from, with hotspots from around the world at the time, like the North Atlantic region and the Persian Gulf, of course. Or you could go for the full campaign mode. After you choose what ships you want in your fleet and designate the lead ship, it's off to plan the strategy. Yeah, you set up your waypoints and can mull over all manner of information and options. The bulk of the game takes place from the deck of whichever ship you decide to take control of, and so the mission goes. You have all manner of modern weapons like Tomahawk missiles, torpedoes, etc. to deal with all sorts of attacks. You can even launch helicopters for scouting purposes, and so much more. This is not a game you can just jump into. You're gonna have to put in the time and pay attention to the instructions to get the most out of it. Graphics and presentation are really good and detailed. Sound again is pretty minimalistic, which is a common thread for this genre. Zap64 magazine raved at this game back in the day, giving it a whopping 96% which I feel is a little bit overboard. But again, this is a very unique game in the genre with a lot to offer and even more depth. So overall, I think it's well worth the plunge. Silent Service was released in 1985 by Microprose. This was only the second simulation game I'd ever played on my C64. The first being, ironically, Microprose's Solo Flight. This game was designed by their golden boy himself, Sid Meier, and was a World War II submarine simulator set in the Pacific Theater. After the events of Pearl Harbor, the majority of the US submarine fleet was sent to the Pacific to help bring down the Japanese Navy and recapture overthrown islands they had acquired. Silent Service was the nickname the US Army employed to describe the U.S. submarine force. One week after Pearl Harbor, the Atutu San Maru, 8,663 tons, became the first victim of an American sub. A dubious honor. 
in the game you are captain of a Gator class attack sub, you got to initially choose either practice runs, convoy action or full on war patrols, followed by setting up how realistic you want the scenarios to play out. The convoy actions options gives you the chance to play out some real life actual historical battles that took place and was always a personal favorite of mine. You have all the views and stats you need and jumping from one room to another is instant which keeps the pace of the game really quick. Jumping around and keeping tabs over everything is vital to your survival and the game has one of the best manuals I've ever seen, covering tons of game info obviously and also about the actual war in the Pacific. This is definitely an easier sim than most on this list and depending on the scenario it could be mere seconds before you encounter enemies so going on those practice runs first is highly recommended. The graphics are really good especially for a 1985 release with adequate sound effects but the surface simplicity of the game is masked by a really deep experience which once mastered makes it one of the best sub simulations on the C64. The game ended up scoring an overall 88% in issue number 13 of Zap64 magazine and was well liked by the entire crew. It ended up becoming Micropost's second best selling game on the C64 with almost half a million copies sold and cemented Sid Meier's reputation as a king of the sim game for many years to come or forever. PHM Pegasus was developed by Lucasfilm and distributed by Electronic Arts in 1987. The game was worked on by the same team as Strike Fleet. This game puts you in the command of a Pegasus class hydrofoil gunboat which was used by the US Navy from 1977 to 1993. They were mostly used for coastal operations like quick strikes, surveillance and narcotics busts. Due to the hydrofoil system raising the boat out of the water they could reach speeds not seen by any other gunboats. Because they fly above the water, they are less vulnerable to underwater explosions than any other craft and not be affected by choppy sea conditions, therefore not slowing them down. They were also all purpose being able to launch harpoon missiles and torpedoes as well as having a close range 76 millimeter gun. The real uniqueness of the ship is to take a small platform and put a very lethal package of weapons on it and provide the ability to operate at high speeds in a relatively high sea state. The PHM stands for Patrol Hydrofoil Missile. The game puts you in the captain's seat of one of these boats with a whole bunch of varied missions to try out, with everything from escort, surveillance and obviously seek and destroy types. Your usual troubled hotspots from around the world at that time make an appearance like the Mediterranean, the Persian Gulf and the Caribbean. Pegasus is a much faster game than Strike Fleet and has some truly epic arcade style action sequences that are an absolute joy to try and survive. The bridge setup is very similar to Strike so if you've played one of these games the other one is going to be a lot easier to get into. It does however have a bit of a steep learning curve initially and instructions are essential to its overall enjoyment. The graphics are very good and atmospheric with some really cool sound effects. It plays well once you learn all the ins and outs and I really enjoyed the mission varieties more than anything else. Zap64's December 1987 issue rated it a 71% overall saying an enjoyable although occasionally sporadic strategy shoot 'em up. I personally like this a little bit more than Strike Fleet. Both games are essentially from the same ilk and are must plays in the realm of Commodore 64 Navy combat simulators. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Are you keeping up with the Commodore? Because the Commodore is keeping up with you. The world's number one selling home computer is now in a family pack, the Commodore 64. Plus data cassette and joystick, four software programs including Introduction to Basic, a Teach Yourself program for the whole family. The Commodore 64 family pack, a value of $700 for just $499. Ocean Ranger was released in 1988 by Activision. This for me is the most underrated game on this list. I never hear anyone ever mention this game which is a real shame. You can think of it as a more arcade action-y version of PHM Pegasus. It's you in a hydrofoil gunboat blasting stuff up. They were definitely inspired by that Lucasfilm classic. US warship to Naval Command. We are under attack. As with all these games you get to select your theater of operation from a bunch of dodgy locations such as the Bering Sea, South 
Southeast Asia, Central America, and of course every Navy simulator's favorite, the Persian Gulf. After that it's off to the briefing room for a more detailed version of your mission before hitting up the ship's stores to load up on supplies for the mission. You're gonna have to balance weapons with fuel and countermeasures and hope you get it right. My advice is, take lots of fuel or else this happens often. The missions for the most part are of the seek and destroy flavor and they play out pretty fast. You're gonna need to find some instructions for this one but it's pretty easy game to get into and is probably the best entry level game to this genre on this list. The action as mentioned is of the arcade action variety so just lock on and blast. There's all manner of targets from other boats, submarines, aircraft and depending on the mission you may only see one type or all. This game's missions can be played pretty quickly or you can save your character and do a career mode where your exploits are recorded and so are your different medals you earn. The graphics and presentation are top notch as are the sound effects and it has a nice little SID tune on the opening screen as well. This is a fun game that looks and plays well and is definitely a hidden gem worth hunting down. Destroyer was released in 1986 by Apex. This game is based on the Fletcher class destroyer as seen in Destroyer Escort earlier. This ship was mainly used by the US Navy in the South Pacific during World War II. For a 1986 game this is really impressive with excellent graphics and presentation and is kind of what you come to expect from Apex during this period. The mission variety in this one is also very cool and diverse. From bombarding some Japanese island bases to hunting subs or rescuing allies there are seven and total, also with different degrees of difficulty for each. The game has all your standard ship screens like bridge, radar, sonar, etc etc and has you going up against sub ships and planes in various missions or if you're really unlucky all of those in one mission which is usually how it goes. Make sure you keep tabs on the ship communications at the bottom of the screen. It lets you know of any dangers and problems and allows you to jump to any part of the ship quickly and access them. Destroyer is definitely a 50-50 game when it comes to sim aspects and action and it works really well. There's enough management and shooting to keep both styles of gamer quite happy. Again instructions are a necessity mainly for accessing different parts of the ship but after that it's a pretty easy game to learn. Just don't try any mission on max difficulty, you'll be swimming with the fishes in no time. In the February 1987 issue of Zap64 they gave the game a massive 85% overall and it's much deserved. Epix did try to replicate this formula for sub battle simulation but it's just nowhere near as good as this game on any level which is a real shame. This game is also a default game on the C64 Maxi as well as the US version of the mini which are easy ways to try it out which is a definite must. Number three. Power at Sea was released in 1988 by Accolade. This is a naval action sim where you get to control all aspects of the naval assault set during 1944 World War II. It's a recreation of the Battle of Lake Gulf in the Pacific. It's considered the biggest naval battle in history with over 200,000 naval personnel involved. The third fleet prepares its opening move in what is to be the greatest naval battle in all history. The battle lasted three days against the Imperial Japanese Navy and it was a combined effort of the American American and Australian forces to take back all the occupied islands the Japanese had invaded and therefore isolate Japan as a whole as well as cripple their oil supply chain. The entire remaining naval strength of Japan is mustered for one final supreme battle. Loss of the Philippines will tear the Japanese empire in two, cutting off the home islands from the oil, the resources, the wealth of the Indies and Southeast Asia, fatally crippling Japan's ability to wage war. You are captain of an aircraft carrier sent to take out strategic positions in the Gulf. There is only one mission in this game, but damn is it epic, and concludes if you manage to take back all four bases. The game plays out on the bridge of the ship as you issue orders, plot your course and wait for the inevitable attack. You can man the guns and stop kamikaze pilots, launch planes off your deck to take out boats and of course bombard the island bases with your cannons before sending in the troops who if you did enough damage will storm the beachhead and take back the base. This game is is such a blast to play. It's similar to Bismarck in that it's a lot more arcade than simulation but there's enough sim to keep it interesting. Be not only able to issue all the orders but to jump in a plane for bombing runs, man the guns and take out aircraft and of course blast away at the island bases themselves. It's just the full naval World War II package in one. Accolade did these games really well. I've got a documentary about them you may enjoy covering their entire history including all their excellent simulation games, top quality graphics, good sound effects, effects and music and solid controls mean this is one of the C64's best in the genre. Number 
Pirates was released in 1987 by Micropost on the C64. It was made by legendary game designer Sid Meier, who also did Airborne Ranger, Gunship, Project Stealth Fighter, Civilization. Actually, the list is pretty much endless. Micropost themselves were known for their simulations, and Pirates, weirdly enough, still falls into this category as you take on the pirate life in this open world game set in the Caribbean. You get to choose what historical pirate era you want to play in, and then it's off for high adventure. The game gives you the freedom to do and go wherever you want without any restrictions, which was an amazingly impressive thing for the time. Living the pirate life is what you do, so finding and recruiting a crew at the local pubs, selling ships and saving in the seas, try and find buried treasure from a map you just bought in a bar is just some of the fun activities. You can meet up with local officials in the town and make alliances with different countries. Be loyal to the British or betray the Spanish, it's all up to you, but it will determine who will hunt you at sea and how you'll be welcomed or not welcomed at many seaside ports. Sailing the seas is a big part of the game and raiding and plundering other ships is how you gain loot cannons, more ships and crew. The ship battles are really fun with you having to pay very close attention to the wind and its direction as well as lowering and hoisting the sails for speed as you blast away at the enemy. Sword fight duels come into play when you raid towns or board the ships you are busy fighting. There you'll have to take out the captains with the amount of men he still has in his crew and your crew playing an important part in the morale and when he'll give up. The game does have a side story as well which you can partake in or not, it's up to you where you can try and reunite your family members who are either enslaved or lost all over the map. The ultimate goal of the game though is to acquire as much loot as humanly possible and then retire. As the game goes on the years go by and so does your health so eventually you'll have to retire but you can actually end the game at any point of your choosing and see what rank and life you'll end up having which there are many. Pirates is an amazingly well designed game that just oozes quality and is still a great fun game to play. There's also been a whole bunch of remakes of this game over the years all of them being very faithful to the original while adding slight improvements here and there. My favourites definitely include 1993's Pirates Gold on PC and the Sega Genesis version. And let's not forget the 2004 PC and Xbox original versions as well, which are all worth checking out and any one of those versions are going to deliver an awesome experience for you. This C64 version however will always be the original and the one I love the most. So if you fancy a bit of a pirate simulation then load this one up, it's classic all the way. Okay, so let's just stop this list for a second here and do some honorable mentions. Although having said that, these I wouldn't really call honorable mentions. These are just a few other simulators that didn't make the list. For whatever reason, these games are all flawed in many ways. But if you like this style of game, you might find some enjoyment in these ones. As far as the top 10 goes, I'm pretty satisfied with the 10 that are in here. That's why I'm saying these are just extras. There's also a little bit of a subgenre of the Navy Sim, a bit of a spin-off type game. I'll mention a few of them here as well, you can check those out if you really like this kind of setting. Okay, the first one is a periscope. Visually this game has that look of a digital integration simulator which always put me off, but despite that it's a decent submarine sim. It was always though at the bottom of my sub list back in the day, so maybe more time with it would have raised my enjoyment somewhat. Next is USS John Young, a pretty late entry in the sim genre. I believe it was released around 1990. It's a game I always found really boring, but it may have been because I didn't have the instructions for it, or it could be that it's just not very good, <laughs> I don't really know. If you ever played it and managed to get some enjoyment out of it, please leave a comment and let me know about it. And last is Broadsides by SSR, a weird pirate style ship versus game, which plays a bit like the pirates battle scenes, but this was released around 1984, so I wonder if Sid got some inspiration from this one. It's a bit of a bizarre and pretty simplistic game, but a fun little curiosity worth checking out I think. And if you're still looking for more, you can try out the many SSR strategy navy war games like Battle Cruiser, War in the South Pacific and Warship. These games have absolutely rubbish graphics and practically no sound, but if it's naval strategy you want, these may be the games for you. Okay, so now let's check out that number one game. Red Storm Rising was released in 1988 by Micropost. The game puts you in the role of a captain of a US nuclear class submarine in modern day, circa 1980s, 
in the Norwegian Sea Theatre. This game is based story-wise on a Tom Clancy novel of the same name that came out in 1986. The game's plot is about Russia's advance and basically setting in motion World War III. Your goal in the game as part of the US submarine detachment is to take on missions like wipe out Soviet destroyer fleets or hunt Soviet wolf pack subs and much much more. The big difference is your performance in these missions alter the storyline and will either aid Russia's advancement or help NATO stop them from acquiring more land and getting those nuclear armed subs into firing position. At the start you get to choose different timelines you want the war to take place in. These alter what submarines are available and weapons, not only for you but Russia as well, which makes for a really interesting choice. The full campaign mode is absolutely epic, where your missions are to destroy Russian boats and subs, thus keeping the American supply chain going, to territories being invaded by Russia such as Norway or Iceland. The game has all the screens you used to seeing at this point in this type of game. There is a lot of information taken initially which may make you feel intimidated, but your sonar screen is where all the action happens, so master its functions and the rest only complement the game. I used to spend hours hunched over my C64 watching the blips and listening to those sounds of the sonar. It may sound boring but it's completely enthralling and made me feel like Jonesy from Hunt for Red October. You may think I'm crazy but I'll bet that magma displacement was actually some new Russian sub and it's headed for the Iceland coast. The best part about this game, like I just said, is that it can be as complicated or as simple as you want it to be. I dived deep into this game in the late 80s and early 90s and the detail was absolutely amazing. The story in the game is absolutely enthralling and presented extremely well with cutscenes setting up and ending missions. Saving your career just like any Microprose game and watching all those medals increase is extremely satisfying. In fact, I still got my original cassette I have my save game career on to this day. This is Sid Meier's third entry on a list of 10, which is pretty crazy. I wonder how many appearances he'll make on my flight simulator list. All the magazines of the time sang its praises, with Zap64 giving it an overall 86%. Top quality graphics and presentation, and excellent opening SID tune, great sound effects in game and a completely enthralling and immersive experience make it my number one naval simulator on the Commodore 64. Okay so how does the Commodore 64 fare in this genre? I think overall quite good. There's not a heck of a lot of these games in this genre especially considering how many games are available for the C64 but what there is, there's really good quality few honorable mentions there which you can also check out. I think the C64 was quite lucky in this genre because of two major developers. Obviously Microprose and Electronic Arts. They delivered some just brilliant Navy simulators during the 80s and without them this list will be a little bit uh, slim pickings. <laughs> Although I've kind of noticed that all the new Commodore 64 companies avoid certain genres in the Commodore 64 totally. Um, I'm guessing because these games are harder to make or something. I uh, don't know the exact answer to this. Simulations, RPGs for the most part, racing games. There's a whole bunch of others they just completely ignore. Um, I'm hoping somebody will take up the mantle and give a Navy simulator a run for its money. You can see what the C64 can do now with uh, modern programmers and have a fair up. I think it'll be very cool. And that's it. Thanks for joining me, Bastish B at 64K. I hope you had a good time. If you can like and subscribe, that'll be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you next time. Cue the chorus line.